We're going to be in Acts 26, starting in verse 13, if you brought your Bible. Or if you got your Bible on the phone. I'm in the New King James, Acts 26, verse 13, but I'm going to lay a little groundwork before we get there. Can everybody hear me okay? So, um, Paul, Paul went around preaching Jesus and messed around and got himself arrested, right? We all know Paul was, was radical about his faith in Christ. So the boldness of this guy amazes me. Like, have you ever been around someone that, like, did not care if they died? Have you ever been? Am I the only one that had a friend like that in high school? Like, it did not matter. That, like, they like didn't care if they died. They're the first one that tried the bicycle jump out to see if it was going to hold together. You know, like one of those kind of things. Kind of or the first one to test the rope swing to see if it was going to hold the weight. And then when they got a car, you didn't want to be in that car. You ever been around somebody like that? I'm talking pedal to the metal down the curviest road you've ever seen in the county. One of them kind of, them people are dangerous, okay? So I tell my kids, you're not allowed to hang around people like that. <laughs> but I'd make one exception. If they're like that for Jesus, I'd probably make an exception for that, all right? Well, Paul was one of those kind of guys. Like he went to the temple in Jerusalem and preached Jesus at the temple to the Jews. I'm talking about the people that arrested Jesus and tried him and crucified him and killed him on a cross just a few years prior. And Paul's standing there at the temple preaching that Jesus is the Messiah. I'm talking about the boldness of this guy. And then just a few years prior to when he was preaching Jesus, they had arrested James for preaching Jesus. And they killed James. And Paul's standing there testifying about Jesus is the Messiah. So a long story short, uh, Paul ends up in the courtroom. He gets arrested. He ends up in the courtroom or the, or the, the auditorium of Governor Festus and the visiting king Agrippa. And all the commanders, all the prominent men of the city, all the people of, of standing in the city were present in that auditorium. And Paul's going to give his testimony. It, it would be like going to the state house and the, and the governor's there, the mayor's there, all the elected officials are there, all the bank presidents are there, all the people that have standing in the community are there in the auditorium and you're standing in the middle of them preaching Jesus. That, that's the kind of scene we're entering into in the text. That's the groundwork. So Acts 26, verse, starting verse 13. And Paul's going to address King Agrippa in the text. So he just got done preaching about Jesus living and Jesus dying and raising from the dead, okay? So verse 13, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now notice, Paul was persecuting Christians, but Jesus took it personal. Okay? So he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. To make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins. Amen. We all need that. And an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Verse 19. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works that show they have repented. So Paul is standing there in the auditorium in front of all these prominent people. 
And he's testifying that, that a man named Jesus was killed and put in a tomb and was dead for three days and got up from the dead. And he was convinced of what he was saying. And that God, God had, he testified that Jesus knocked him off his horse, that he was blind, right? And that God had called him to open the eyes of the blind, to turn people from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, right? That people should repent and turn to God. So he's preaching in a room full of bigwigs. He's preaching in a room full of people that, that currently do not believe in Jesus. Right? Now, they may not have believed everything Paul was saying, but I can bet you this. They believed Paul believed it. They may not have agreed with everything Paul was saying. They may not have been convinced of what Paul was saying, but you can bet they were convinced that Paul was convinced. Like, the boldness of this guy just shocks me. And, and like Paul was convinced of Jesus dying and raising from the dead. He was convinced that we should turn from darkness to light. Paul was convinced that we should repent and turn to God. And he's testifying that in front of all these people by himself. So how was Paul so confident in what he was saying? Like, like how was Paul so secure in his belief in Christ? That's my question. And I present to you probably these two things. The word of God and personal encounter. See, Paul was convinced because of God's word, number one. But number two, the spiritual experiences that he had with God. Now, you don't need to be knocked off your horse and blinded for three days. And then a man come lay his hands on you and you receive your sight. And you hear the audible voice of Jesus. Right? You don't have to have that happen to you for you to be convinced, right? It happened to Paul. It was a spiritual encounter. But, but there's many other spiritual encounters in the Bible that other people had. There's many other examples of spiritual experiences that people have had in the Word of God that convince them of their faith in Christ. Number one is probably a changed life. There are millions of people all over the world today that can testify that their life has been changed by the message of Jesus Christ. That they, their, their life was in shambles and their life was a wreck. And they lived in the back alley and they were down in the gutter. And they were in the dumps of life. And the message of Jesus Christ came across their path and raised them up out of that place. And put their feet on solid ground. And change their life and they can testify, I'm a new person today. Why? Because of the gospel. Because of the power of the message of Jesus Christ. That is a spiritual encounter. Number two is probably freedom from addiction. I could fill this room this morning with people that I personally know that have been set free from the power of addiction. I'm talking about addiction, addiction to meth, addiction to heroin, cocaine, addiction to perversion, addiction to a lifestyle that's against God. That, that when something that was more powerful than them came upon their life and would, would drive them down into a low place, that would drive them to do things that they never thought they would ever do. I'm talking about the power of addiction. It can grab somebody that's in a good place in life and take their life down a pathway that they never thought they would go down and wreck their life and wreck their family and wreck all the, the ones that are close to them and hurt everybody around them. Why? The power of addiction drives their life in a bad place. But the message of Jesus Christ can set people free from that stuff. Amen? Okay, I can't be the only one happy this morning. I'm going to make you talk back to me, okay? So what I'm saying is the power of the gospel message of Jesus Christ can set you free from that stuff. You don't have to be a slave to that. You don't have to be in bondage to drugs. You don't have to be in bondage to addiction. You don't have to be in bondage to perversion or looking at things on the Internet you know you shouldn't be looking at. You don't have to be bound by that stuff. You can be free because Jesus is actively involved in setting people free today. Listen, that is a spiritual encounter. Okay? Another one is maybe you went through a hard season in life. Maybe you went through a chaotic season in life 
and you went down a path that would have crushed most people. But all of a sudden, you felt an overwhelming sense of peace come on your life to get you through that season. What would have crushed most people, what would have made most people lose their marbles, you held it together because you felt the peace of God on your life. You see what I'm saying? Maybe it was a sickness you dealt with. Maybe it was a busted marriage that you went through. Maybe it was something else that came and attacked your life, but you got through it with a sense of peace. Listen, that is a spiritual encounter. That is not normal, okay? Most people fold up and, and, and go, right? But if you get through it with a sense of peace, that is a spiritual encounter. Maybe you entered into a season of depression. And you felt like life's not worth living anymore. And I thought probably ought to just check out. Maybe that has hit you in your life at some point. But you are sitting here today. Listen, that is a spiritual encounter. Because a lot of people don't come back from that, okay? Maybe you had a dream from God that really shook you to the core one night, and it, and it changed your life, and it changed how you were feeling inside. Maybe you had a dream that was real powerful that hit you. That is a spiritual encounter. Maybe, maybe you were in prayer, and you, and you felt God leading you a certain way, and you decided to go that way, and you found out later it really was God leading you. That is a spiritual encounter. Maybe today during worship, you felt like crying. Maybe a song really touched your heart and, and you got stirred up emotionally inside. Maybe tears came down your, foot, down your cheeks. Maybe you felt the presence of God and, and the, the chaos of the week and the things that have been building up on your life and the pressure that has come against you in that moment, the anxiety that you were carrying in that moment, it went away. And you felt different. You felt like it's going to be okay. That is a spiritual encounter. That is the presence of God. That can set you free from that stuff. And bring peace to your life. So all these things are spiritual experiences. There's, there's many more like it. But what it does is it connects your faith with God's word in a tangible way. Right? It's God's word and it's encounter. Spiritual experience. Now, if all we had was the word, that would be enough. Don't get me wrong. I'm not downplaying the word. But I'm saying we can have what the word says we can have. I'm saying that God is active and involved in our lives today, just like his word says he is. All right? So Paul was convinced of Jesus, and he was completely sold out and unmovable in his faith. Now, sadly, a lot of young people today begin to fall away from their faith in high school. Statistically, 70% of people that enter into college as a professing Christian, 70% of them will exit college not professing to be a Christian. 70%. Listen, that's a problem. I promise you, most of those people never encountered Jesus. Most of those people just came into an intellectual agreement with the Bible, but they never had a life experience with him. I promise you, most of those people probably never saw a miraculous work in their life. Most of those people probably never saw prayer answered on a consistent basis. Now, there's a story of a little boy that went ice fishing with his dad. And... They get in the ice fishing hut, and it's cold in there. The dad brings a little propane heater. You know, things get red hot. And he fires that propane heater up, and they're sitting there, and he tells his boy, he says, son, you see that heater? It's hot. Don't touch it. Now, the little boy believes that the heater's hot. But his dad turns around to grab some poles, and the little boy reaches out and touches the heater. Listen, now he knows it's hot. There is a difference. See, he came into intellectual agreement and he believed it was hot, but now he knows it's hot. Why? It burnt his hand. And it would not matter if a hundred people were sitting outside of that ice fishing gut trying to convince him the heater was hot. He's way past debate. You can't talk him out of that. 
You're not going to bring up an argument against him to try to talk him out of that heater's not hot. I know it's hot. Why? It burnt my hand. Right? And I'm saying we have to enter, we have to move out of an intellectual agreement with only an intellectual agreement with the Bible and move into a life experience with God is what I'm saying. We have to move past a head knowledge of God and, and enter into a life experience with Him. See, I am determined to see God move in our midst. I am determined. I'm going to cry, man. I am determined to see God move in this generation. I am determined to see God change our communities. I'm determined to see God move in our churches again. Come on, can somebody clap your hands with me in this place? Come on. I can't be the only one that's passionate about this stuff. I want to see God move in this generation and save this generation from the craziness we see going on in society. And it's going to take the people of God to rise up and grab a hold of the promises of this book and run with it, man. Because God will back you up. God will be with you if you will walk by faith. Sorry. <laughs> You're going to have to excuse me. I am extra passionate today. So you may be sitting here this morning and you may say, you know, I don't even know if I believe in miracles. And I would say this to you. Gideon didn't believe in miracles either. If you remember right, Judges chapter 6. The Midianites were coming to the nation of Israel when their wheat fields would begin to be ripened. And they were dried out and they would set their wheat fields on fire and burn them up. Well, Gideon said, well, I'm going to harvest my wheat early before it's burnable. So he harvested his wheat, and he's hiding in a wine press, underground in a wine press. And all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord appears to him and says, you mighty man of valor, God has called you to deliver the people. Now, an angel, he's hiding in a wine press, mind you, like, like. He's being punked by the Midianites, and it, like a scared little guy, he's hiding underground, beating weed out of the husk. And an angel of the Lord appears and said, mighty man of valor. What do you mean, my, I'm hiding in a wine press. But see, God will oftentimes speak to you about your future and call you into something greater. Like he speaks those things that be not as though they were, right? And he calls you into a greater place of faith. So he says, thou mighty man of valor, God has called you to deliver the people. And Gideon says, if God has called me to deliver the people, then where's all the miracles at that our fathers told us about? And in a roundabout way, the angel looked at him and said, listen, you are that miracle. And I'm saying this, you may be sitting here today saying, where's all the miracles we read about in the Bible? Where's all the miracles that we read about in the book of Acts? And I'm saying this to you. What if you are that miracle? What if you are the one that God is calling to bring about change to your peers? To preach the gospel to those that are, that are around you? What if God is calling you to bring about change in this generation? What if you are a Gideon? I'm yelling a lot, but I'm not mad, okay? I'm just passionate. Everybody all right? So what if you are the one that God's going to bring about change in your family? Is what I'm saying. I come to challenge you this morning. See, what if, what if you are the one that's supposed to believe his word, even though other people don't? What if you are the one that's supposed to believe what it says? And grab a hold of it and believe for stuff you've never seen before. What if you are the one that God is saying, even if no one else is believing with you, will you stand in faith and believe what he said? Now, I debated on sharing this story because this is a spiritual encounter that I had. It's not normal. It doesn't happen every day. And I'm not trying to be somebody I'm not. So I, I, that's why I debated on sharing it, but I'm going to share it with you. <clears throat> so I was standing in my kitchen one morning, and I was praying. And I said, 
God, teach me how to walk like Jesus walked. And as soon as I said the word walked, teach me how to walk like Jesus walked, I hear a voice on the inside of me say, you will see a man in a white shirt. He has pain in his lower back. Pray for him. And I thought, now, did I make that up and then say it to myself? You know, that's the first thought I had, honestly. So I, I said, so well, I'm not going to make something up like that and then say it to myself. So I wrote it down on a piece of paper and stuck it in my pocket. Well, about two, two hours later, I'm at the local high school walking down the main hallway, and there's a guy in a white shirt walking towards me. And, and the closer we get, the, the closer my heart gets to my throat. You know what I mean? Like, the closer he's getting to me, the more scared I'm getting. And I'm, I'm, you know, and I'm thinking, I'm either going to look like a complete idiot or this is God, you know. <laughs> so, and it wasn't like a normal white shirt. It was a white undershirt. People don't wear white shirts typically. Usually an undershirt is under another shirt, right? Well, this was the only shirt he had on. It was white, brand new. <laughs> so God was like, ring, you know. So he gets close, and I say, hey, do you have pain in your lower back? And he said, I do have pain in my lower back. I don't know what I did to my back last night, but, but I could not sleep all night. I took a muscle relaxer. I took pain medicine. I don't even know what I did, but it, it's been hurting ever since. So I pull that note out of my pocket and hand it to him. And he reads it. It says, you will see a man in a white shirt. He has pain in his lower back. Pray for him. And he looked at me and his jaw dropped. And I said, that's a nice shirt you got on. Can I pray for you? <laughs> and he said, yes. So I prayed the simplest prayer you could ever think of. Father, he take all the pain away from his lower back. In Jesus' name, amen. He bends down, puts both hands on the ground. Flat on the ground. Comes back up and his eyes are this big around. And he said, all my pain is gone. And we laughed and we hugged. And, and, and I was just as shocked as he was. My eyes were that big round too, you know. And, and, but what I'm talking about is encounter. What I'm talking about is spiritual experience. What I'm talking about is the promises of this book say, it says is available to us. And that God is actively involved in people's life. Listen, that stuff is true. So, so there is no turning back now for me. You all understand that, right? Like, nobody's going to be able to talk me out of my faith. Why? Because of God's word and spiritual encounter. I'm saying this. What if you were convinced like Paul was? What if your children were, were convinced like that? See, it would not matter if, if someone tried to bring an argument against them to try to talk them out of their faith. How many of y'all know that, that a person with an argument has no power over a person with an, ex, with an experience? We all get that, right? You won't be able to talk them out of their faith. Why? Because it burnt their hand. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? We need to come out of a, of a place of just knowledge about God and enter into a place of encounter with God. Amen? I'm just saying we need to be a people that believe God for the impossible. That we believe that addictions can be broken off people's life by prayer. That we believe depression can leave you for the rest of your life and never come back to you again. That we believe that marriages can be restored and relationships can be healed. And families can come back together around the love of God. Come on, can we clap our hands again in this place this morning? I want to be a people that believe God for the impossible. That we believe God wants to. That God wants to be involved and God wants to heal your life. And God wants to be intimately involved in everything that you do. And he loves the people that you love. We, 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 uh, we take, I'm closing, sorry. We take the term love of God, like God loves all people. And we just spread it like butter over grandmama's cornbread. It just covers everything. It's just a blanket statement. And we view God loves all people as a blanket statement, but we don't view it as a personal statement. Let me ask you this. Does God love you? Does God care about you? Personal. Yes, he does. See, God, I don't want to. 
I don't want to assume everybody understands the theology that God is not bound by time. The Bible says that God is not bound by time. That, that, that God created time. That he is the beginning and he is the end at the same time. Right? Like right now. So God can be in... But my point is this. God's not too busy for you. Okay? Like when you get in prayer, God is with you. Personally. He's not bound by time. He's not busy doing something else. He's very intentional about being busy with you. And developing your life. And calling you into a greater place of faith. Right? I'm on a rabbit trail now. But my, my point is this. We need to be a people that are actively engaged in what God is doing in the world. And we line our belief and our faith up with what he is doing. Amen? Can we clap our hands one more time? Amen. Let's pray. I want to pray real quick before we get into the rest of the service here. So if we are going to see God move in our mess, listen, we're going to have to pray. We're going to have to, we're going to have to do something different than what we've always done in order to see God move in our mess. So we need to be intentional about prayer, intentional about reading his word, intentional about seeking God. And you may be in here today, if we could close our eyes, if we could bow our heads and close our eyes. You may be in here today, and something that I said has hit you. Something that I said has hit you in your heart, and you feel the tug of God. Maybe you hear the voice of God like he spoke to Gideon and said, you mighty man of valor. God's called you to deliver the people. Maybe God is speaking to you that which is not, but he's calling you into a better place. He's calling you into a deeper place in God. Like you feel the pull on your heart this morning. <clears throat> and I want to say to you, God is after you. God is for you. God wants to bring you into a better place in him. God wants to set you free from addiction. God wants to set you free from depression. God wants to set you free from anxiety and hopelessness. God wants to take you to a healthy place. God wants you to be a good mother. God wants you to be a good father. God wants to bring you into a place of security and health so that you can be used by him in the earth to help other people. So if you're in here today and, and you're battling some of those things, depression, anxiety, addiction, hopelessness, and I want you to pray with me just silently in your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I, I give it all to you. I hold nothing back. I thank you that you love me. I want to walk with you, but I don't know how. Teach me how. Help me. Lead and guide me. Keep me on the right path. I surrender everything to you. I, I renounce the addiction. I renounce the perversion. I renounce the things that are convicting my own conscience, that are separating me from you. I don't want those things in my life anymore. I just want you. Set me free today. So God, I pray blessing over every person. I pray that we become more passionate than we ever have been. That we be intentional about seeking you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.